Uh, if you remember, I ended my teaching last week. Uh, I said I was doing a two-part message that I titled, A Place to be Fruitful, and I ended with a quote from the book of Isaiah, chapter 8, and I talked about verses 4 and 5, and spoke about the young and the old filling the streets. So um, I just decided to go, actually, not Isaiah, Zachariah, Zachariah chapter 8, verses 4 and 5. So I'll go back to the book of Zachariah, and um, I will do a third part to my message, A Place to be Fruitful. So this will be A Place to be Fruitful, part three. And that will conclude the series, A Place to be Fruitful, part three. We talked about Rehoboth uh, in parts one and two, but we are shifting gears a little, and we are going to Isaiah, uh, Zachariah, chapter eight. And my main text is from verse 12. Zachariah chapter 8 and verse 12. And this is what it says. For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give its fruit, the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give their due. I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these. Isaiah was a, uh, Zachariah, why do I keep calling him Isaiah? Zachariah was a very important prophet to, uh, to Judah. He and another prophet called Haggai were raised by God after Judah returned from captivity in Babylon and Persia, and, uh, and they came to build what is called the second temple. The first temple of Israel was built by Solomon. You remember uh, David wanted to build it, and God appointed Solomon to build it. That was the first temple that was built, but that temple was broken down and destroyed when Babylon came to conquer Judah. So the whole temple was brought down and the items of the temple were all taken away from the temple. So now, after 70 years of captivity, the people have come back to the land and they want to build a new temple uh, in Jerusalem. And this is what much of the books of Zachariah and Haggai uh, talk about uh, because Haggai and Zachariah were the prophets that God used to encourage the people uh, to build the second temple. The project of the rebuilding of the temple was led by the governor of Judah called Zerubbabel and the high priest at that time was called Joshua. And, and so what we read is a prophecy about uh, the temple uh, to a large extent through the prophet Zechariah. Although Zechariah prophesied about the temple, much of what he said about the temple was not about the temple they were building at the time, but the coming of the true temple, Jesus Christ. And so in the prophecies of Zechariah, you find part of it related to the time when they were building the temple, and part of it speaks to the future, the coming of Christ, and even to the second coming of Christ. So uh, Zechariah's prophecies are very, very profound. Now, in this particular one that we read in verse 12, uh, this prophecy is situated between two eras the era of disaster, because they have seen disaster, everything has been destroyed, and then they are looking forward to the future with hope. And Zachariah is positioning what he's saying within this time from disaster to reconstruction, from disaster to reconstruction. And in between disaster and reconstruction, he is speaking. I don't know about you, but maybe you may also be standing somewhere between disaster 
and reconstruction. Your past is disaster. Your future is bright. But God is giving you a word for this season, this place where you are between disaster and reconstruction. So Zachariah speaks to them and says, God says to them that the sea shall be prosperous, the vine shall give its fruit, the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give the dew. Now, I will place what Zachariah said within a logical sequence. So we look at God's promise to the people. There are four things that God promised to them. The first one is that the heavens shall give their rain. In the sequence, in a logical sequence, the heavens shall give their rain. And, and, and really, it didn't actually say rain. It said dew. And that is very instructive. God says, I'm going to give you dew. Now, you know about dew. We normally see the dew at dawn uh, when temperature changes from hot to cold and then uh, there's uh, moisture in the air uh, and we have these little droplets of water. In the Middle East, dew was very important because most times they don't have rain. And God said to the people, I will give you dew. Dew is not like rain that comes in large volumes. Dew comes one dawn at a time. So when you receive dew this morning, it will not saturate the whole earth as rain does. So the next morning, you need another dew. And the next morning, you need another dew. It talks about God's mercies that are renewed for us every morning every morning you go and there will be something for you it's like the manna that god gave to israel in the wilderness you don't have everything you need for all time but every morning he says the heavens will give you dew i believe that god has a way of giving us droplets dew of his mercy of his goodness of his favor of his abundance in small supplies every morning and that is what he's, uh, he tells uh, the people of Judah the dew shall fall every morning the heavens will give the dew secondly God spoke about the ground he says the ground shall give her increase a dry land does not support increase but the land that has had a touch of dew has enough water for the day to survive. And so God says, every day, when the dew falls, your ground shall be ministered to. The ground talks about the environment, the place where you are. You know, many times we want God to give us rain. And there are times God gives us rain. When it rains, the ground is soaked. And you can tell there's been a visitation. But when there is dew, you can't tell whether there's been a visitation or not. You know, there are many times you get up in the morning and you walk to your, uh, your compound or wherever you live. And you look to the ground and you see the ground is damp. And you wonder, did it rain or did it not rain? Normally what you see is dew. It is a visitation, but it is not overwhelming. But it still touches the ground. So God says to Judah, I will give you the dew, and the dew shall make your ground yield its increase. When God gives you dew, you may not see abundance all of a sudden, but your ground will not be dry. Your ground will receive the ministration of the dew of heaven. So that's the second thing God said. I'll give you the dew. Your ground shall yield her increase. And then the third thing is that the seed shall be prosperous. It's an interesting statement. The seed shall be prosperous. He says, I'm going to give you dew. And when I give you dew on your ground, when you sow your seed, your seed shall be prosperous. The reason why I said uh, that statement is interesting is that when you read it in the Hebrew, it's a little uh, interesting because the word that is translated prosper, the sea shall be prosperous, 
is shalom, peace. So if you were to read it literally, it would mean the seed will be peaceful. Now, what, what does that mean when it says your seed will be peaceful? A peaceful seed is almost like uh, you sow tomatoes on the ground and the tomato is peaceful. But the interpreters or the translators translated shalom as prosperity, prosperous, or fruitful. Why did they translate it as prosperous? Because shalom also includes prosperity. But there is a deeper reason for that. At that time when the people of Judah came back to their land from Babylon, there were all kinds of people around who had been occupiers of the land, occupiers of the land whilst they were away. So when they came back, these people were not happy that these, the original landowners have come. So anytime they sowed their field, these enemies around will come and fight them and destroy the seed. And so they, they plant their seed, people will fight them and destroy the seed. Uh, they, their fields start growing and people will fight them and destroy it. So there was constant war. But that is when Zachariah comes in and God says, in this season, I'm doing something special for you. And he says, your seed that falls to the ground will no longer be fought over. It will be prosperous. So if, if, if you look at it, God is saying, I have brought you to a season. I've given you dew. I've given your land moisture. And your seed will not be fought over. Your effort will not be fought over. Nobody will steal from you that which is yours. And the seed will be allowed to flourish. The seed will be allowed to flourish. Your seed shall be prosperous. That's a third promise. And the fourth promise God gave to them. He says, the vine shall give its fruit. The vine shall give its fruit. So, first, there is the dew of heaven. Second, there is the ground that is now fruitful. It is increasing, yielding her fruit. There is a seed that is planted that is prosperous. And then he talks about the vine shall be fruitful. Now, when you look at it and you, you do a casual reading of the Bible, you would think the vine being fruitful is the same as the seed being prosperous. But they are not the same. The vine will be fruitful. The seed will be prosperous. The reason is the vine is not planted as seed. If you know anything about vine, you don't plant the seed. You plant a stalk or a cutting, a stem, and put it on the ground. So the previous message, the seed shall be prosperous, is not for the vine. Because the vine is not a seed. But now God speaks to the vine and says that in addition to the seed being prosperous, the vine will also be fruitful. Two different things. What is the difference? Now, the seed there refers to the, the grains that they planted, like, like wheat, like barley. These are things you plant, and as we do in Ghana, you plant corn, three months later you reap. But the, the vine, you don't plant and reap in three months. So the seed being prosperous, the grain, says your short-term effort will be prosperous. And your long-term effort, the vine, will also be fruitful. God is saying to them, in the short term and in the long term, I will bless your work. In the short term and in the long term, I will bless your work. What you sow today, in three months, I will give you results. But there are things you are sowing today, you will not get it in three months because it is vine. And you will see the result maybe a year from now, two years from now, ten years from now. And the difference between the grain and the vine is that for the grain, when you harvest, you destroy the plant. But when the vine is harvested, the plant still remains. And season after season, season after season, you keep reaping. So God is saying to Judah, in between your disaster 
and your fruitfulness, I am affecting your environment. How am I affecting your environment? I'm giving you dew from heaven. I am touching your land. I am touching your seed and I'm touching your vine. I don't know about you, but it seems like a good word for somebody here. That in between disaster and fruitfulness and abundance, God is touching the weather, the environment, your seed and your vine. And all along, a chain of fruitfulness is coming your way. Now, whom did God speak to? What, who was the target of this prophecy? If you read the passage, and I'll read the passage again, it says, For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give its fruit, the ground shall give her increase, the heavens shall give their due. I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all of these. So who is the target? Of God's promises. And the target of God's promise in the prophecy of Zechariah is stated clearly the remnant. The remnant. This promise is to the remnant of God's people. They are the ones God is speaking to, the remnant. Frequently, in the prophecies that God gave to Judah before they went into captivity and after they came out of captivity. There is mention of remnant. If you are a good student of your Bible, you would have come across the word remnant. It's a very powerful word. Isaiah spoke about them. Jeremiah spoke about them. Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, Micah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zachariah, Malachi. All of them spoke about the remnant. The remnant. So who are the remnant because this prophecy is for the remnant it's not for everybody it's for the remnant and what does the term remnant mean first it means those who have survived a disaster those whom God has preserved through the fire and through the storm the remnant in Israel Refer to those who survived the years of captivity. Some were carried away as children into captivity and returned in their old age back to their land. Others were born in captivity and had suffered from birth till they returned. Each one of them bore marks of survival. The remnant are those who have gone through trials and tribulations and survived. By application, it speaks to everybody who has survived trial and tribulation. You went through the fire. You went through the storm. You went through hardship. You were buried on the ground, but you are still here. That is the remnant, those who have survived. Secondly, the word remnant also refers to those who were left behind. Normally in the Bible, it is used for leftovers after a meal. So, when the meal has been eaten, what drops? That's the remnant. So, the remnant, therefore, refers to people who were left over. They were left over. It is similar to images we see of people who have survived the war. If you've watched some of the documentaries of uh, those who survived the Holocaust of the Jews in Nazi Germany, whether in Auschwitz in Poland or in some other place, and you see those pictures of the people, it looks like life left them behind. They have survived, but you look at them, they are emaciated, their bones are showing through their skin, they, 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 their eyes are hollow. Their, their clothes are in drags. Looks like they've been left behind. They survive, but they are left behind. Life has passed them. We see that when we look at refugees of war, and you look at them and you wonder, can they ever make it? So when God talks about remnant, he's talked about people who went through disaster. But when you see them, they look like leftover human beings.
people who have been abandoned, left over. On the outside, they seem like leftover people. But on the inside, they are not leftover people. They are overcomers. But their image is not inspiring. So God speaks to the remnant, those who have survived. And sometimes when you survive tragedy, people look at you and shake their head and say, mm, mm. Once you see him, eh, you will cry. When you see him, you will cry. Looks like you've been left over. It is to those people that God says, the heavens will give their rain. Your ground shall be fruitful, shall yield her increase. Your seed shall prosper and your vine shall be fruitful. I am talking to a remnant people. You've gone through the fire. You've gone through the storm. You've gone through hardship. People look at you and shake their head. They think you've been left over. You are the leftover, the dregs of society. But God has not forgotten the remnant. And his promise is to the remnant. That the third thing that qualifies people as remnant refers to those who have remained faithful to God. The remnant didn't just survive the war, but their faith survived. They went through hardship, but they didn't abandon God. They are like the three Hebrew children, remnant, who said we will not bow. So if you went through the storm, you don't look too good now, but your faith in God remains strong then God has a word for you. God has a promise for you. You may look disheveled. People may think your best days are over. Time has left you. Opportunity has left you. You are the leftover people of this earth. But God says to you, they left you, but I never left you. And he says, the heavens will give you due. Your ground will yield its increase. Your seed shall prosper. Your vine shall be fruitful. I am encouraging somebody here this morning. God did not leave you. He did not abandon you. You went through the fire. You were singed. We can smell fire on you. We can even smell failure around you. But God's mercy has never left you. And you are not leftover people. You are not leftover food. You are not the abandoned of the Lord. You are the redeemed of the Lord. And his promise to you is sure. And it will come to pass. If you are the remnant, say, I receive it. And I like how Isaiah says, uh, Zachariah says it. He says, God says, I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these blessings. I will cause it. I will cause it. That means that God will be the instigator, the originator, and the promoter of the welfare of his people. I will cause it. I will instigate it. I will originate it. I will promote it. So how does the Lord cause us to possess all of these things? How does God do it? When he says, I will cause it to happen, how does he do it? How does he cause it? Three things. Four. First, when God promises you or when God says, he will cause you to inherit something. He makes provision for it. He makes them available to us. He sets it up for us. He moves all things to align with his purposes. When God wants you to possess something, he makes it available. In the realm of the spirit and in the realm of the natural. S secondly, 
after he has made it available, he promises to do it. He makes us aware of it. Just like I'm preaching to you from the Bible. It's the promises of God concerning what he has already laid in store. In the Bible, we discover the things that God has made available to us. In addition, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit concerning the things that God has laid in store for us. I has not seen nor ear heard. Neither has it entered the heart of man. The things that God has laid in store for his people. But the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, reveals them to us. The Holy Spirit bears witness. Thirdly, when God wants us to possess something, he makes us pursue it. He gives us a zeal for them. He gives us appetite for those things. He turns our hearts towards them. And the Holy Spirit triggers a prayer burden for those things. We find our prayer pointing more and more in a particular direction. And as you pray in the Spirit, your mind and thoughts turn in that direction. And in addition to prayer, he gives you the strength to work towards those things that he has laid before you. And that's what happened to Israel when they wanted to build a temple. They didn't have money. They didn't have anything. But their heart desire, their passion was to build. Because God had laid that burden upon them. In your moment of recovery, consider the things that God has given you the zeal for. And not only does God make us pursue them, he performs what he has promised. And this is the last stage of the process. This is when we possess what God has made available to us. This morning, I came to speak to everyone who feels like a remnant, who feels they've been through the worst days and the seasons of their life. And even when you survive it, you don't look like much because you are the remnant. You are like a leftover something. But your faith in God has remained. And back from the words of the prophet Zechariah, we can bring this promise of God to us. And finally in verse 13 of Zechariah chapter 8, this is what God says. And it shall come to pass that just as you are a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so I will save you. And you shall be a blessing. Do not fear. Let your hands be strong. The curse will be overturned. Deliverance will come from the Lord. And you will be a blessing to the world. Your story will end on the note of a blessing. People will hear of you and say, what a testimony. What a story. We never knew that this is what you went through, but see what God has done for you. People will come to you and say, please pray for us so we will also go through our storm and overcome because God says in the end you will be a blessing to many people. This morning, just before I close, I want us to spend just a few minutes praying. We want to pray. We want to pray. And if you feel like any part of this message re resonated with you, you believe God spoke to you this morning, I just want us to join in this prayer. The first prayer is to pray that God will make us remain strong in faith through every trial and tribulation. And pray and say, Lord, strengthen me with might in my spirit. Just talk to the Lord and say, Lord, strengthen me. I'm not giving up. I'm not bowing. I'm not, I'm not going to surrender. Help me, Lord. Give me strength. Give me the courage. Help me, Lord. Help me by your spirit. Help me with might in my inner man. Help me to remain strong in faith through every trial, through every storm, through every hardship. Help me, Lord. Just talk to the Lord. Just talk to the Lord. Ask for his strength. He said, remain strong. Remain strong. Pray for strength. Not to fail. Your faith will not fail. Your faith will not fail. Your faith will not fail. You will not bow. You will not be destroyed. 
You've gone through the fire, but you will come out strong with a testimony. Lord, help us to remain strong in you. To remain strong in you. Secondly, I want you to pray and ask the Lord to lead you with the, in, to the specific areas he wants for you. Specific promises. And ask him to open your heart to the things that he has laid in store for you. There is a blessing that God has restored for you in this season of restoration. It has been kept for you. It has been kept for you. It is yours. And ask the Lord to open your heart to it so that your prayer, your zeal, your intensity, your work shall be properly directed. Just pray to the Lord. You don't just want to survive a storm. You want to come out with a testimony. You don't just want to come out with a testimony. You want to be a blessing to other people. Lord, show us. Open our hearts. Stare our hearts. Stare our hearts. Help us, Lord, to discern. Help us, Lord, to discern the things that you have laid in store for us. Help me, Lord, to know the things that you have laid in store for me. The opportunities you have opened for me. The favor, the people you have planted in my life. The people I must meet. The places I must go. Help me, Lord, to discover them. Help me, Lord, not to miss them. In the name of Jesus. And number three, I want us to pray. And you just want to say, Lord, I receive the dew of heaven over my life. Refresh my soul with your presence. Show me your favor. May the dew of heaven fall upon you this morning. And every morning, every morning, may you wake up with the dew of heaven. May you wake up with the goodness of the Lord. May you wake up with new mercy. May you wake up with fresh ideas. May you wake up with fresh insight. May you wake up with inspirational thoughts. The dew of heaven will water you. Just pray and say, Lord, every day, let every day every day be your presence every day be your glory every day Lord visit me every day speak to me I may not know everything but I want to receive your direction every day oh talk to the Lord this morning I receive the dew of heaven over my life I receive the refreshing of the Lord over my life I receive renewal over my life in the name of Jesus. And finally, I want you to pray and ask the Lord to bless your sweat and your toil. And cause your ground to give its increase. And cause your seeds to prosper. And cause your vine to be fruitful. There are things you have done in the short term that you will see quick results with. But there are also things that God has planned into your vine. It will not happen today, but it will happen tomorrow. So you are praying both for the seed to prosper and the vine to bear fruit. Begin to talk to the Lord. Begin to talk to the Lord. You will not sweat in vain. You will not toil in vain. You will not hustle in vain. You will not struggle in vain. Your pain will not be in vain. Your tears will not be in vain. Your struggle will not be in vain. Your prayer will not be in vain. Your fasting will not be in vain. Your seeking of the Lord will not be in vain. In the name of Jesus, God brought you as a remnant, not to showcase you as a disaster, but to showcase you as a testimony. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And finally, if any part of this message I preach today and what I preached last week and what I preached last two weeks about a place to be fruitful, any part resonated with you and you believe this word is for me, just put your hand upon your heart. Just put on your heart, upon your heart. I want to come into agreement with you. At the point of agreement, at the point where you just felt God has spoken to me, this word is for me, this particular promise is mine. At that point, I want to come into agreement with you. As your pastor, I come into agreement with you. Father, 
I come into agreement with every man, every woman, every boy, every girl whose spirit resonated with your word just as the baby leapt in the womb of Elizabeth at the salutation of Mary. Their spirits leapt in them at the salutation of your word. Father, for that point of recognition in their spirit, you ignited the fire of the spirit. And so, Lord, I come into agreement with them concerning that area of agreement that there will be a performance, that there will be a manifestation. If it is seed that is short-term manifested, if it is vine that is long-term manifested, but Lord, in their Rehoboth, in their place of favor, where you are making room for them, cause every remnant, every remnant to walk in your power, to walk in your glory, to walk in your prosperity, to walk in your fruitfulness, let there be a turn around. Let there be a change. Let the dew of heaven fall, O oh Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I come into full agreement with you. That you will have a testimony. That you will be a blessing. The Lord will bring you out. Before the year ends. Before the year ends, your seed shall prosper. Before the year ends, your vine shall yield her fruit. And I come into full agreement that from now to the end of the year, you will experience sequences of supernatural activity in your life that will overturn what the enemy has done in your life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give God praise, somebody. Oh, do it well to the Lord. Do it well to the Lord. I believe these messages are prophetic messages to somebody. And I want you to latch your spirit onto that word. Because it is going to bring sequences of events of turn around in your life. In Jesus name. The remnant shall possess their possession in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. And amen.